Orange County Supervisor Todd Spitzer wants to be the county's next district attorney, and he's gearing up for a heated campaign against incumbent Tony Rakakis. What does Spitzer think about victims' rights, the problem of the homeless, and infighting between the Sheriff's Department and the Fire Authority? That's next on Inside OC. Inside OC is brought to you by... Each new community Five Point brings to life represents a promise delivered. Great neighborhoods are more than just places to live, they are places to connect. Five Point is a proud sponsor of public television and community programming. Chapman University is a proud sponsor of Inside OC and community programming. Hi, I'm Rick Reef. On our prior show, we heard Orange County Supervisor Todd Spitzer explain why he wants to unseat incumbent DA Tony Rakakis. Our interview continues with a focus on key issues. So Todd, as, uh, as you've noted, the DA is a big office with a lot of, uh, uh, a lot of lawyers, 275 lawyers, $150 million budget. Right, right, nine, right, almost 900 employees. So, um, and uh, the the incumbent Tony Rakakis has been severely criticized for his management of that office. Uh, uh, and uh, so, then the question is, <clears throat> are are you a qualified manager? And so, the record, of course, would be to look at you and your staff. You've had, for the most part, much smaller staffs as a uh, as a lawmaker. Right, um, and uh, you have high turnover. You've had high turnover. You had some. You had a high-profile case, Irvine Councilman Jeff Lalloway, who came and joined you as chief of staff, and was very short-lived, matter of weeks, I think. Um, and you just recently had a case where a former employee sued for uh, wage and hours violations, and there was a hundred fifty thousand dollar settlement. Okay, so the question is, uh, how do you feel about your record as a manager? Well, I've been doing this for 25 years. I've had employees for 25 years. Certainly anybody who's run a large organization, and as a county supervisor, we have 18,000 employees. So you're always gonna get folks from time to time that have issues, but I'm very firm about this. And that is, I don't subscribe to the theory that when you work for government, that just because you get a paycheck every two weeks, that you've earned that or you're entitled to it. I have very high expectations of myself. I mean, I'm. I've done a lot of things in my career. I, I work 24-7. Um, I would squeeze in more if I could. Um, but the fact is, is that people who come to work and think that they're not gonna improve their skills or get better or be accountable because they're gonna get paid automatically, that really disturbs me, it bothers me. So from time to time, you are gonna have incidents with staff. And um, until I found the proper fit, my staff today is excellent um, and they're doing a phenomenal job. But, uh, you know, that one particular employee, it's unfortunate. I gave her a great opportunity. She worked for me for a while, but she got a new supervisor. I didn't supervise her directly. She got a new supervisor, and that person revealed to me that she wasn't doing her job. And so uh, she was like, oh. Yeah. You know, I do remember you making the comment uh, that she failed to learn even the most fundamental computer skills. Yeah, which, I found which, out. But, but that made me think, why did you hire somebody that no, didn't have fundamental computer skills? Well, because in the beginning, she was just answering the phones and everything uh -huh. else. She was just, she was a front office person, uh -huh. a receptionist. But over time, as she was supposed to take on more and more responsibility, she was being supervised by the chief of staff at that time, who realized that she wasn't carrying her load. And they recommended that she take classes and the like, and she refused to do any of that. So the recommendation from the chief of staff was she needed to be let yeah. go. I met with her, tried to get her to make those improvements, and she wasn't interested. Okay, let's talk about a huge issue. You've heard about this many times, uh, and that's the cost of public employee pensions. Sure. And of course, as a uh, as the if you become the DA, you will be supervising mm -hmm. investigators who uh, qualify for those uh, safety pensions. Right. Are, are public safety pensions blowing holes in government budgets? Yeah, of course they are. Um, public safety is, is taking the largest portion of most 
uh, tax dollars in Orange County in particular. And because of the fact we're a donor county, we only keep about six cents of every mm -hmm. dollar we send to Sacramento. Of course, there's, you're gonna feel the reverberations of that. I was the one that actually led the initiative at the Board of Supervisors to allow new employees to opt in to, uh, to opt out, excuse mm -hmm. me, to opt out of the pension. Because you don't get a pension until you're there for 10 years for, to vest mm -hmm. on a pension. So a lot of people are not gonna be there for the 10 years. So we offered an opportunity to opt out and um, that because of IRS and some other difficulties, Loretta Sanchez was working on this when she was in Congress. Um, not, we haven't been able to implement that, but I've always looked for a path to try to make sure these public pensions are now, responsible. As you know, our former, or your former colleague, uh, who's now in the state Senate, John Morlock, uh, criticized you for being among the supervisors who many years ago voted for the pension spike for the safety officers. Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, right? And, and that you have since, the, the three percent at 50, which, yeah, 3 which is 50. hard for people to understand, but <clears throat> basically it was a, a retroactive instant increase both retroactively and going forward for safety officers, and it's right. it's cost several billion dollars statewide, uh, statewide. No, just to the the county. Uh, if you look at the county's well, unfunded the, porch, uh, our pension. unfunded actuarial though over the years has come right. down well, dramatically. Bottom line is, you've said that was a mistake, right? If you had to vote for not it the all three percent at fifty, the retroactive portion. Okay. Yeah, the all retroactive. Right. right. Okay, but to you think the three percent at fifty is okay? You know, okay. I am so proud of the fact, I'm very concerned that crime is up 20% in our county. One of, the reasons I, one of the reasons I am running for district mm -hmm. attorney is crime is up 20%. People feel very unsafe today in our county and they are expressing that. And so you have to have top-notch law enforcement and I'm not gonna co compromise people's safety by not making sure we get the best law enforcement so, for Orange County. Uh, what does that mean in terms of the uh, AOCD, uh, the association, uh, uh, the association of Orange County, Orange County, County Sheriffs? Deputy Sheriffs. Yeah. <laughs> I forgot the S. A O C D S. Um, mm. uh, are are and of course Tony's. I think has had their uh, Tony Rakakis, the incumbent DA, has had their support over the years. Are are you going to be seeking their support? I yeah, I'm sure they're going to be having interviews, and of course I'll go in and interview with them. Of course, I mean. Um, I've been a very staunch supporter of law enforcement in this county, and I think it's very, very important to um, seek the support of people and you've been supportive I, and of. And if they say, Todd, we want you to stand with us when we want uh, uh, wage increases, and uh, you know we don't want anybody tampering with the pension formulas and things like that, what, what would you say to them? Well, I've said uh, many, many times over the course of many years to both firefighters, who also are first responders and subject to those pensions, as well as uh, sworn peace officers, that you cannot bankrupt the system. And if you want that system to be there for you in retirement, you have to be responsible about it. But absolutely, the number one priority of government is public safety. And when crime is out of control, Tony Rakakis has done nothing to prevent crime being out of control. And he's done nothing to distinguish himself at, or have a plan to get crime under control then certainly I'm gonna be running for district attorney to distinguish myself from Okay, him. let's talk about uh, some things that have been uh, big issues for you and things you feel strongly about. Marcy's Law, what's Marcy's Law and uh, how were you involved in that? So in 2008, the voters of California um, passed by a slim margin, 52%, uh, the most comprehensive to date at that time, uh, Victims' Bill of Rights for the state of California. Subsequent to 2008, uh, Dr. Henry Nicholas has been doing it in other states to try to get it passed in other states because I think his eventual goal is to amend the United States Constitution. But what it does is it gives victims the right to be heard at every critical stage of the proceeding. So. Um, and so I fought for that. I was asked to be the campaign manager for, for that. For instance, so like on uh, a parole hearings, they would be notified so they could that, step forward. They've always been like notified that. of parole hearings, but um, there was some significant changes, but I'll give you an example. Right. In the old well, days. No, no, that, that, that's right, uh, because we've got so much yeah. to cover. But anyway, so it, it gives rights. Uh, they also get heard now. We hear the victim speak at sentencing. Is that at part of Marcy's law? That is part of Marcy's law. That was there before, but Paul Wilson, for example, when Rakakis botched the salon shooting case and uh -huh. got kicked off the case. Paul Wilson, who's endorsed me, his wife Christy was murdered. Um, he, he was able to 
talk to the judge at every stage of the proceeding, almost every hearing, and express, just like the other victims, their outrage about how bad Rakakis was and how much he botched that case. That, that's unheard of before Marcy's Law. That is now a right given to victims in California. Okay. Uh, I've heard you say, though, that you're saying Marcy's Law isn't working. Explain that. Well, I'll give you an example. You know, Marcy's Law has been on the books for nine years now, but the district attorney's office continues to violate Marcy's Law. Recently, a young girl who goes to Cal State Fullerton, actually a woman, um, she was hit by a drunk driver, 0.18 BAC, and he fled. He was eventually apprehended. The district attorney's office knew that the victims wanted to speak before sentencing, but they didn't notify the victim. And so now that case has to be potentially unwound and started all over again because of Marcy's Law, because the district attorney violated their rights. We consistently see that the district attorney is not providing training, either on Marcy's Law or informant issues. Uh, they, they continually acknowledge when they get caught that they need to do a better job, but again, they keep blaming it on bad training. And Rick, the fact is, they, the, Tony Rakakis eliminated the district attorney's training unit from the district mm -hmm. attorney's office. He only re-implemented it after he got okay. kicked off the decry case. And I, I should stipulate that uh, uh, since, uh, uh, you know, Tony Rakakis is taking some heat here on this show, that he has an mm. open invitation yeah. to come on the show. So uh, He should and, absolutely and, 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 and if the two of you, uh, if, uh, and perhaps next year, if the two of you are in the thick of it, uh, I hope to get both of you on at the same well, time. Well, it's interesting because he so. went on 60 Minutes, and he was interviewed on 60 Minutes, right. and he literally said, um, who would use informants? They're untrustworthy. Well, he was using informants the whole time. So yeah. even if he goes on h your show, I'm not sure you could believe he's trustworthy. Oh, okay. All right. Anyway, uh, uh, let's uh, let's talk about another issue: uh, the Orange County <laughs> Fire Authority. You've served on the Orange County Fire Authority right. board. There's a lot going on at the fire authority and the fire authority vis-a-vis <coughs> -vis the sheriff's department. And we've got uh, the Canyon Fire, where there were some questions raised about response times and that and this helicopter war. So take mm -hmm. whichever one you want first. Well, you know, this is a good example of an area where irrespective of who's on what side and who's fighting what argument, I'm gonna be there to make sure that things get handled, right? So those same people that wanna be critics, the, this is a skill set you need to run this county and to get involved in public policy and find solutions. So for example, there's this war now between firefighters and the sheriff's department. Sheriff thinks it should be able to drop water on fires. I do too. Well, the firefighters don't want that. They want that all protected by only fire. Well, my attitude is this. In 2008, when the whole county was on fire and we couldn't get a darn helicopter in our county and I was in the state legislature and fought with Schwarzenegger about this, I w my whole argument was we need as many helicopters as possible. Who cares if they're green or if they're red? Get helicopters, right? And today, my, I have the same attitude. So I'm looking at the sheriff's department, I'm looking at the firefighters, I'm saying knock this off, okay? We expect you to be professionals. With respect to Canyon- No, no, Mar but let's talk more about the helicopter sure. because it's a little more complicated than that. You, the fire authority uh, <clears throat> uh, 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 basically uh, I think is saying or suggesting that the sheriff now has their own paramedics. In other words, the idea was okay, that's that, different than that, fire, that, that you that's had no, no, but, but, the, but you had the helicopters doing the rescue. You know, you had the the uh, fire authority helicopters with paramedics. Okay, and so they're doing rescues if somebody needs right. paramedic. You right. have the sheriff's helicopters more for like crime control if there's you know a riot or something going on. And now with, it, it almost looks like the sheriff's building up its own little fiefdom here. I think and, that's and, true. And, and the, or you said you think that's true? No, the sheriff's that, told me, yeah. the sheriff herself has told me that she believes she should have every ability to, to put paramedics on but her But then the argument is that sometimes the, uh, the fire authority has been alleging that the sheriff will get a call and even though a fire authority helicopter is closer, they won't give the call to the sheriff because they want their okay. guy to get see, there. Do you and, see yeah. how this sounds though? Do you see how this sounds? It sounds petty. It sounds like it's people in a sandbox throwing stuff at each other, okay? Mm -hmm. I'm not tolerating it. This is the deal. If you're in an area of the county and you need an emergency call, you, you hurt yourself, you fell off a cliff, yeah. broke a leg, whatever. If the closest helicopter 
to help you, has the skill set and the ability and is certified, irrespective of its color, sheriff or, or fire. It should be able to respond if it's the closest and can get to you first. Okay. And you think you could you could iron this problem out, which which clearly hasn't been ironed out. Right, because this is part of the investigation that Supervisor Nelson and I are leading. We, as part of the investigation of Canyon uh -huh. 1 and Canyon 2, we're including this whole issue of whether or not Sheriff's Department can also be concurrent or work together okay. with fire on these services. So let's talk about what's the Canyon fire problem about? Well, uh, so you had a Canyon 1 fire that burned actually away from Orange County. It burned uh, in Anaheim uh, near Green River in the 91, and it went, it went east towards Corona, and it burned a lot of homes in Corona. <clears throat> As that, that, that was handled, and it was mopped up, but then we knew we were having red flag winds, and uh, that, sparked <clears throat> that sparked some Canyon 1 flare-up, and that caused Canyon 2. The issue is on the morning of Canyon 2, should there have been met better monitoring about the aftermath of Canyon 1, which now we know caused Canyon 2? That's the issue. And it, it sounds like from <coughs> some of the reporting that, yeah, there's some, some questions raised here that maybe it wasn't <coughs> monitored as well. Well, as I'm very concerned. Be. Where Canyon 1 was, that was under the jurisdiction of the United States Forest Service. On the morning, knowing there was red flag, they weren't out there at the scene, just observing to see whether or not there was any flare-ups. I That's gonna be part of the investigation. Should there have been eyes on that area because we knew we had a fire. The night before, there was a fire in the Sierra Peak, which is higher mm -hmm. up. So we knew there was other things still burning, fair. Yeah. And then lastly, people were calling in that they saw fire on the 91 on that Monday morning during the red flag. And they were basically interrogated by the dispatcher at the fire authority about did they really see fire and then we had our nearest station in the fire authority network that wasn't properly staffed because that unit had been dispatched up to northern california for their fires so i think it was a coming together of a lot of situations yeah. that cause potential public now, safety jeopardy let me ask jeopardy. about that because i haven't really heard anybody question that decision to send that that uh, a truck up to <coughs> northern california you know, I guess, yeah, that somebody's having a problem, everybody wants to go and help. Boy, to go from Orange County all the way up there, I mean, in hindsight, was that a smart decision? Well, that, look, we have mutual aid responsibilities, and when we have fire, I mean, when I was out on the fire line for the Canyon 2, we had people from Calexico. I mean, we, you get everybody you can get, but I think the policy is going to be, and I'm leading this discussion, and I'm going to force this discussion, we're not gonna send a unit for, for mutual aid away from our county until we know there's a replacement unit, especially if we have a red flag. Mm -hmm. And that's what happened here. We let a company go when we didn't have a replacement in place. You know, that sounds so sensible. It just seems, I'm a little surprised that the fire officials didn't figure that or well, go that's, through again, that process. Well, that's again, that's why we're having an investigation because we need an outside third party to evaluate this, who's not, you know, doesn't really have any skin in the game, if you will, to help us right. formulate policy. I, I got to tell you, though, just a, as a citizen sitting there thinking, wow, you mean the f that, that you need to have an investigation that these guys are professional firefighters and they don't themselves say, wait, before we send it up there, we've got a bad situation here. We better have something here. I, that sounds kind of derelict to me. Well, I'm very concerned. But again, you know, you, you, you see, you say, oh, you know, you go and interview with these groups. Are they going to tell you how to be? No, no one's going to tell me how to be. As district attorney, I'm not beholden to anybody, Rick. I'm only beholden to the voters okay. of, of, of this district, okay? And you know, you know, based upon all the issues I've handled over the years, some very controversial ones, like El Toro Airport, right? I will always get in and do what I think is the right thing. No. Irrespective of the consequences. Okay. Another issue that I know you feel strongly about, you've been confronting it as a supervisor, and that's the issue of the homeless and the problem Absolutely. we've got there. And is there a role for the DA in that? And just talk about what, what's happening and what you want to do about it. Well, of course there's a role for the DA. The, the homeless issue in Orange County is a public safety issue. Crime is up 20%. AB 109ers, which used to go to state prison, are now in our county jails, right? They're now supervised by probation, not parole, right? The state, they're not supervised by the mm -hmm. state system, now locals. Yeah. Crimes have begun from felony to misdemeanor. 
When you're the district attorney of the third largest county in the state, you have an absolute responsibility to be a leader on these discussions. When they wanted to early release prisoners under Schwarzenegger when I was in the legislature, who do you think they used in the state legislature, Rick, to stop early release of prisoners? Me. And we didn't release one prisoner early because I traveled the entire state and I spoke out to every community and newspaper about early release. Tony Rakakis has been nowhere to be found on these issues. And we, the, the district attorney of Orange County needs to be a spokesperson for public safety because you can see if you're asleep at the switch, All right, so let's, then yeah. these policies go through and they are hurting our county. Okay, so what do we, <clears throat> what, what would you do about the homeless situation? Okay, so let's talk about the homeless. First of all, I've been very empathetic and compassionate. We now have services out on the riverbed and all throughout this county to help people transition from being on the street to shelter. We opened up 400 beds in Santa Ana. We put the first year-round homeless shelter in my district. No one wants these shelters, Rick. And I said, put it in my district. And it's been a phenomenal success. That's the bridges at Kramer. We now have the armories open. So we have places for people to go. Once we establish that we have a place for people to go, the rest of the people that are living on that riverbed are not gonna be able to be there. We can't let that riverbed be Orange County's skid row. I'm not gonna allow it. So we are now, we have a public safety uh, enforcement. You saw thousands of bicycles stolen and hidden in the riverbed. A, a cavern made in the riverbed for who knows what purpose, right? A stolen gun was found or a gun was found. We have a criminal element living out there and I'm not gonna allow it to happen. Do you think the <clears> county <throat> has been too lax about that? About clearing it out? Why well, did it take so long? Because we got sued by the ACLU. And Judge Dave Carter, who actually married me and my wife, um, he put out an injunction and he has made it very clear that for every person we have on the riverbed, we have to create a space for them somewhere else. Well, now I get to go back to Judge Carter and say, Judge, I got 90% of these people who don't want any government services. So make me make one bed for 10, but don't make me make one bed for every person. So m I'm confident now that we're clearing out the riverbed from Fountain Valley and from the north, and we're pushing it towards the middle, towards the injunction zone, that we're gonna be able to convince Judge Carter that we're gonna clear the entire riverbed. A riverbed is not a place for people right, to live. I guess I missed something there. How <laughs> is, uh, why don't you create the bed for that, uh, that person, and then if they refuse to take it, you- Why would it. I ask the taxpayers to pay to create all these expensive beds when nine of 10 are not gonna use the bed? The point is, in a legal okay. proceeding, right. I, I, I'm right. only going to create a bed okay. for people who want a bed, all right. not extra but beds. But you would guarantee the judge that anybody who wanted a bed would have a bed. That's, I now, what do you do about the other nine, though? Where, where are they going to go? Where do the other nine go that don't want the help, but you got to get them off well, the river? Well, maybe bed? they go back and live with the people that they were living with before they either got kicked out or were using their drugs or whatever. And then whatever. they'll get away and they'll go right back to the riverbed. Well, Rick, I, I'm not trying to be argumentative, but I'm well, just saying that it's such, a tough, it's such a tough problem. And I, uh, as much as what you're saying, I don't really see where there's a solution. Well, first of all, this is happening all over our nation. Yes. But I'm yes. not going to allow this to happen in Orange County without absolutely creating beds and making sure that people understand this is a public safety issue. This is jeopardizing our public safety. And I'm not going to tolerate it. Okay. Finally, uh, Maybe, uh, what do you see as the <coughs> biggest issue facing law enforcement? So when I came back to Orange County, um, after I left the legislature, <clears throat> I started doing trials again. Now I started doing trials in 1990, and so now this is 2008. When I picked juries in the 1990s, while I stood up, I'm the prosecutor, the juries loved us, they trusted us, they trusted the police officers. I came back in 2008 and now jurors are telling me during jury selection, you can't trust police officers, they lie. The district attorney's office, we know they cheat. I was beside myself. And what I think is missing in Orange County is we don't have a credible district attorney. Yeah, but is that really something <clears throat> that's just particular to Orange County? Isn't there a distrust of uh, police and, and the <clears throat> law <clears throat> nationwide? There, Rick, there is. But the fact is, Tony Rakakis has been ranked the worst district attorney in the nation by Harvard and one of the worst in California. Mm -hmm. 
because of cheating, fabrication of evidence, and the like. If we don't elect a district attorney who's credible, we're going to have to retry all these cases at great cost to the taxpayers, re-victimize victims, and so we need a credible DA. And so when you wrap all this up, having a credible district attorney in Orange County finally is really will help us with every single social problem we're facing today. Yeah, well, Todd, you have uh, taken a lot of time today. We've uh, gone through <laughs> two shows. You have, you have teed this up wonderfully. Again, Tony, come on anytime you want, and, uh, and I look forward to getting both of you on next year. I think it's going to be one, one interesting race. I love it. Thanks so much, Todd. Thank you. That's it for now. Thanks again to my guest, Todd Spitzer. You can watch this show and past shows by going to pbsocal.org or rickreef.com. You can also catch our shows and our post-show open mic chatter on YouTube. And follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Thanks for watching. We'll see you again on Inside OC. Inside OC is brought to you by each new community Five Point brings to life represents a promise delivered. Great neighborhoods are more than just places to live, they are places to connect. Five Point is a proud sponsor of public television and community programming. All your life, people talk about what's best for you. But to most people, it's just that. Talk. Unless you're with Memorial Care, a healthcare system devoted to one important thing, what's best for you.